Okay, good morning everyone. And uh, again, I'm very grateful that you're here. It is terribly cold outside. A lot of reasons to stay home under the blankets, but uh, it gives me encouragement to see so many come out for church this morning. We're going to continue studying uh, the Sermon on the Mount today. We're going to look at one verse. It's probably the most important verse in the Bible, in all honesty. It is the summarization of God's entire word in one verse. It's Matthew 7, 12. But before we get to that, I I just want to share some scripture with you from Deuteronomy to help set the tone a little bit. In Deuteronomy, Moses receives the law of God. And he gives it to the nation of Israel. And this is just a reading from part of God's law. And it's in Deuteronomy 22, starting in verse 1, and I picked out an agricultural, uh, agriculturally significant verse here. Moses says, You shall not see your brother's ox or his sheep going astray and ignore him, or ignore them. You shall take them back to your brother. And if he does not live near you, or you do not know who he is, You shall bring it to your home, and it shall stay with you until your brother seeks it. Then you shall restore it to him. And you should do the same with his donkey, or with his garment, or with any lost thing of your brother's, which he loses and you find. You may not ignore it. You shall not see your brother's donkey or ox fallen down by the way and ignore them. You shall help him to lift them up again. Garments, ox, sheep, anything God says that belongs to our brother, we are to give back or take to them or keep care of until such time that we have the opportunity to restore them. And he says brother, and he, and he means the nation of Israel, but... It extends far past that because God in this verse says, anyone, anyone who lives near you, even if you don't know them. So that would possibly include Gentiles, which have been very significant for the Jews to hear. They may have blocked it out, but it's what God said. But it's the point of these regulations that I just read. Among the 613 laws that God gave Moses is the point of what I just read on for us to know how to handle our neighbor's livestock. Is that what God wants us to get out of that verse? It's much more than that. This is an illustration in how we are to treat our neighbors and how we are to look out for one another. And Jesus takes pity on his disciples, us, knowing how we could never, ever possibly remember 613 laws and follow them. And he does a great thing in the Sermon on the Mount. He summarizes the entire Old Testament and New Testament in one verse. So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. For this is the law, and the prophets. Anybody know what that phrase is called? The golden rule. The golden rule, that's right. And this is Jesus' golden rule. And there's something very specifically important about Jesus' golden rule. It's completely positive. You'll understand what I mean as we go through this. Notice what Jesus says at the end of the golden rule first. He summarizes the statement and says, for this is the law and the prophets. Now Jesus is saying in this one statement, because the New Testament didn't exist yet, although the word was being pronounced by the word, Jesus says, what I'm telling you right now represents the entire Old Testament. That would have included the first five books, the law, and then the history books such as Chronicles and Kings, Proverbs, That's poetry. And then it would include all the prophets, both major and minor. Jesus says, everything that you know that you have preserved by God for you to understand how you are to relate to Him and 
your brother is summarized in this verse. The funny thing, though, it seems to me, is Jesus is reaching a little bit. Because when He says, so whatever you wish you do to others, whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, to them He doesn't include the love of God in that. Kind of confused, confused me. Well, here's the thing. Our loving God, that's supposed to be a given. He shouldn't have to tell us that we are to love God. It's number one on the list. Love God more than anything else. Number one, the greatest commandment. So he's assuming, as he speaks to his disciples, as he's sharing through his word with us, that we already know this. That we are to love God with all of our mind, our heart, our soul, and our strength. He's assuming we already know that. And there's another thing he's assuming. He's assuming that we don't have a problem with loving ourselves. And I would say most of us probably are going, yeah, that's probably pretty accurate. I think quite a bit of myself. And obviously we do. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. We're even commanded to love our bodies. To love the temple in which the Holy Spirit dwells in our hearts. We're to love that. But without loving God first, without having agape love, remember there's eros, agape, and phileo. Phileo, the city of Philadelphia, eros is sexual, and agape is a brotherly love. Okay? If we don't love God with agape love, we are not capable of understanding how to show agape love to our brother. That's just a fact. Without loving God first, we are destined to live our entire life in a most selfish condition. Lost, without hope, and without God in the world. Yeah, that's a verse from the New Testament. That's from Peter 2, verse 9. When he tells us that we were adopted in when we were part of the nation of Abraham. But before that, before the sacrifice, we were lost without hope and without God in the world. And this again is just another example of Jesus talking about selflessness. He is not assuming that you love God. Well, he is assuming you love God, but he's not assuming that... Uh, I'm sorry... I know myself. He's not only assuming that you love God, but he knows you probably have no problem loving yourself. And it's an incredible statement because it reflects these presuppositions. Listen to what he says again. So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. That statement alone presupposes that we love God and that we love ourselves because we want to do, he tells us to do what we want our neighbors to do to us. That's the, that's the whole point with the ox and the sheep. Okay, we go along. I'm going down the road. I see Mike's lamb in the ditch laying there. Oh, there's Mike's lamb. And I go on. Would, would I want Mike to, to treat me that way? That's what, that's what he's saying. If this was your lamb, wouldn't you want Mike to stop and take care of your lamb? Absolutely. That's the whole point. It's, it's that we are to love one another. The very first word, though, of Matthew 7, now I'm going to go to the beginning, 7.12 is so. So, many, many translations say therefore. And that is a very interesting word because it's a connector. Anytime you see so or therefore, it depends upon subject matter that's already been discussed. When you're reading Scripture, if you see so or therefore, you're going to have to look back to understand the point that's being made. It's a connector. What is Jesus connecting for us? Certainly, like I said, it's what is prior, but how far prior is our context? Many would argue that Jesus is saying this as a response to the fact that we learned last week that our Heavenly Father wants to give us good gifts. 
That, so since we know that our Heavenly Father wants to give us good gifts, we should do whatever you wish that others would do to you. It's so much more than that. It, it, it's so much more than that. Jesus is using this as a summary for all that He has preached in the body of the Sermon on the Mount. All the way back to Matthew 5.17. We had the Beatitudes. We had the salt and light passage. Then the body of the sermon starts. And Jesus says something very familiar in that verse. He says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. And then in Matthew 7.12, He says, This is the law and the prophets. Bookends. Bookends to the body of His sermon. Jesus is saying, Everything that I've taught you in this sermon... Everything I taught you is reflected in the Law and the Prophets. And I have fulfilled it. I have made it clear. I have revealed its very purpose to you. You see, I want to just go back just a little bit. The Sermon on the Mount took extreme issue with the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the scribes. They were practicing the letter of the law. They weren't realizing the heart of the law. They were terribly corrupt and awful men. The religious leaders of, of Israel were corrupt and awful. Jesus says this is the law and the prophets. All those patriarchs and prophets, all that they wrote and lived out, all that was affected and inspired and commanded by God has now been realized. And everything was, that was accomplished in the Old Testament was a benefit for all who preceded the Old Testament in understanding relationships. First century Palestine. This is the time frame that we're talking about when Jesus gave this sermon. In first century Palestine, this positive command from Jesus of Nazareth would have been shocking. Totally unexpected for a Jewish rabbi to get up and say, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. People would have freaked out. First of all, the Pharisees taught, love your brother, hate your enemy. Jesus did not teach that. He said, if you only love your brother, what blessing is there in that? What reward is there in that? I tell you, pray for your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Quite the opposite of what the rabbis taught. Now Jesus' golden rule, as I said, is quite significant in itself because it's positive. It calls us to action. Do unto others. Well, that means I've really got to interact with you all. I have to have uh, a relationship of some sort with you. I've got to get off my tush and get to work. Y'all heard of Confucius? Confucius had the golden rule too. <laughs> Basically, Confucius and a rabbi by the name of Hillel, remember who studied under Hillel? Or maybe it was Gamaliel, I can't remember. But this, this is the Apostle Paul's timeline here, guys. All right? And Hillel was surely there when Jesus was crucified. In 20 AD, Confucius, or I'm sorry, Confucius' teaching before or after Hillel's went like this. He says, Do nothing to your neighbor, which after your word you would not have your neighbor do to you. Do nothing to your neighbor. Big difference. Rabbi Hillel was challenged by a Gentile to summarize the law in a very short time. Such a short time that the Gentile could stand on one leg and hold his balance. Seriously, that was the charge. He says, Rabbi Hillel, I want you to summarize the whole entire Old Testament while I stand on one leg. It's silly, but that's the truth. This is kind of how things were done. This is how challenges were done in the first century. And Hillel responded with this statement. He says, what is hateful to you, do not do to anyone else. This is the whole law. All the rest is commentary. Go and learn it. See, negative again, though. Negative again. 
He says, what is hateful to you, do not do to anyone else. Again, I don't have to have anything to do with you. I can just sit on my tush. I can coast. Jesus is calling us to positive action in the golden rule. Jesus' statement will not allow us to do nothing. We are to do unto others as we desire them to do to you or to us. This is completely different from the negative statements that Hillel and Confucius put out for their followers. Let's talk about murder. What did Jesus say about murder in the body of the text? He said, if you hate your brother, you've committed murder against him in your heart. Now, if I take the negative form here of the law, and I say, well, I haven't murdered anybody. I can just sit back. I'm good. I haven't broken that command. Very legalistic. I haven't, I haven't taken a, a, a knife and pierced someone's heart. But Jesus is saying, no, if you hate your brother, you've committed murder. Same thing with adultery. All the, all the rabbis said, oh, well, if you don't cheat on your spouse, you haven't committed adultery. Well, I haven't committed adultery, so I'm not guilty of it. What did Jesus say about adultery? If you look at someone else with lustful intent, you have committed adultery with them in your heart. And we all know, living in this world, how hard that is to avoid. Sex is everywhere. It's at your fingertips. It's on your billboards. It pops up on your cell phone, your computer. You name it. It's in our face. All sources of media tell us sex sells. And they're going to continue to bombard us with sex sells. Now, how many of you have seen the uh, commercial of, I, mean, I don't even remember what it was. Oh yeah, I do too. Of this gal she, she just continually licks this ice cream cone very provocatively. And it's about a stinking hamburger commercial. I mean, it's not even, it just got your attention. And then at all the end, you, oh, Burger King. Didn't realize we were talking about Burger King there. So Jesus basically says that if you have forgot the details in the heat of the moment, when you are at this point with your friend or your brother and you're ready to strangle them, when you're at that point, you're not going to remember 613 laws and how to deal with them. All you've got to remember is one. When you're at that point, just remember the one. And you can't go wrong. You know, we don't want somebody else strangling us. We've got to remember the one. This is not a call to do, duplicate goodwill or, show, or favor shown to us first. This is a command to initiate love. Now, in order for me to do unto Ronnie, I don't have to wait for Ronnie to show me some love first. That's not what Jesus says. You initiate the love. You initiate the relationship. Ronnie's my friend. He's my brother in Christ. He's known me since I was a baby. It's not very hard for me to do. Because I do love Ronnie. But what about the person that's my enemy? Are they exempt? No. No. They're not exempt. This golden rule makes no limitations on who is the recipient of our initiatory love. And we know this from Jesus' prior teaching. He says, those good things are going to heap, it's like keeping burning coals on their head, your enemies. If you pray for them, if you do good deeds for them, they're going to think, what on earth is wrong with them? And they're not going to get their way. They haven't got your goat, so to speak. They haven't got under your skin because in turn you've showed them love. Jesus says there is no guarantee on who the other person is. You are just called to action. Remember, this is not agreeable to fleshly or worldly thinking. When somebody punches us, we punch them back twice. So that they don't do it again. You do something wrong to me, watch what I do to you. That's what the world teaches. This is 
discipleship training. Discipleship training of Christ Jesus, the one who created the universe, the one who died on the cross. So we don't have to. And in discipleship training, these commands are given to us from the Master Himself. Jesus is the Master. We are the doulos. We are the slaves. Remember that Greek word, doulos? We have to be obedient to the Master. You cannot serve two masters. We are to be obedient to these commands and guidelines given in con- conduct. We're to do this on a daily basis. Tim Bourgeois, when I listened to his sermon on this, it reminded me that we're not to use this command as priming the pump. You know what I mean by priming the pump? I'm not supposed to feel out someone on how they're going to respond with a little act of love. That should not be my purpose. If I'm, if I'm laying out Jesus' command to love my neighbor, to do unto others as I would want them to do unto me. It's not about me going to Tanner to see, hey, is Tanner going to show me some love back, so I'm going to do this. It's not what this is. It has nothing to do with the other person, but it has everything to do with the other person. We're not acting in a manner of testing the waters. This teaching is only selflessly motivated if we understand Jesus right. We have to understand Him right. The the liberals, and I don't mean any political party, I just mean somebody with a liberal mind will take great lengths of gray area with the Scripture. But you have to remember Jesus is just saying, think about how you want them to treat you before you go into action. Now, is it wrong that we hope for a loving reaction? Well, no. I would expect all of you to want to hope for a loving reaction when you do unto someone. We hope for that. But it isn't promised. We're not guaranteed that it will be reciprocated. This is not a knee-jerk reaction or action. Rather, this action requires work. It requires thought. It requires determination. It goes against our very human nature of retribution. That's what we want. We want justice. Jesus says, that's God's job, not yours. You're to do unto others. We can't get off the hook, folks. That's all there is to it. Saying this another way, Jesus is telling us that in any given situation, ask yourself this question. How would I like to be treated? That's it. That's all there is to this. Do you get in a situation with someone? Friend, family member, enemy, stranger? It doesn't matter. Before you open your mouth, before, you, before your brain engages the muscles in your body, you think this thought, how would I like to be treated? We are not to be motivated of the potential for love back. Although, like we've said, there's nothing wrong with that. Preaching this principle will help us get out of the mentality of mindset that leads to retaliation. Retaliation is a knee-jerk reaction. When we retaliate, generally, we have not thought things out. It's like, here comes the left hook, here comes my right hook. It just happens. It's, that is retaliatory. We can't do it. Matter of fact, we're to give the other cheek. It's actually... Hillel and Confucius' negative command lived out. Jesus is using this command to do more than just what you think. He is using this command to turn human behavior inside out. To show us a different way. We are to love that person who is exhibiting bad behavior. 
Happened to me yesterday. I'm sitting between Sarah and Wendy. And daggone it, Verl Holland was not calling fouls like I thought he should. And I let him know. And they're both like, Alan, Alan. I'm like, what? Okay? We, we are to set our minds on things that are noble, true, praiseworthy. We are to think on these things. The Apostle Paul told us that. We are to find something good in that moment. We're to find something good in that moment to focus upon as we think of the loving reaction required on our part as a disciple of Christ. Either one of those girls could have turned and said, Alex, shut up! But they didn't. They were quiet about it, you know. How does this actually play out? We've all seen people lose their cool, right? And maybe maybe even toward us. At a distance, we can join into the gossip. Oh, can you believe how that person acted? And they do that all the time. It just sickens me. We, we could be that person. But in that moment of exhibited bad behavior, a disciple of Jesus must think or say something worthy of praise about that person. Now, why? Why should we do that? Because it creates an incredible change in our hearts. When we focus on whatever is noble, whatever is true, whatever is praiseworthy, the negative goes away. The hate goes away. We, we change our minds to change our hearts. Yeah, that's Scripture too. It's in Romans. Instead of feeling disgust about that person, we instead focus on the positive and our feelings change to favor and empathy. Oh yeah, I've done that. Yeah, they, they, they went off the deep end, but I've been there. You know, normally, normally Jill isn't like that. That's usually what I have to say. Okay? Now, we cannot exhibit this change in our behavior, which is part of what of a theological term called sanctification. Okay? Sanctification is the process, after we are immersed in Christ and receive the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit starts to work on us. And He improves us in God's righteousness until we take our last breath. He's there helping us, molding us and making us to look like Jesus. Do we always listen? No, we don't. But he's always there. There's always that whisper. There's always that thought planted in our mind. But folks, we can't fix it if we don't know it's broke. Right? And I'll tell you something. We're all broken. We are all broken. God's law has a very specific purpose. God's 613 laws have a very specific purpose. Do you know what it is? To convict you of your sin. God's law, first and foremost, has a purpose of convicting you of your sin, of telling you you're wrong, of showing you that you're guilty, and that you deserve Judgment. The law of God exposes the sin in our life. That's what it does. All of these statements make nothing more important than God. Say God's name with love and respect. Honor God by resting on the seventh day. Love and respect your parents. Love and respect your parents! <laughs> Don't hurt anyone. Always be a faithful spouse. Don't take stuff that doesn't belong to you. Always tell the truth. Be content with what is yours and don't wish for other people's stuff. Now that's not the King James Version, but I really like that version. The 
The law of God convicts us or exposes us with the sin in our life. You see, without the law of God, we would be able to fool ourselves, fool ourselves and justify a gob of sin. Well, so-and-so does it. Well, I saw the preacher doing it. I mean, you know, that's what the law does. It's not about them, it's about us. And without the law, we wouldn't be able to realize it. God's law holds us accountable to God's righteousness. God's righteousness is perfect. His law is perfect. And it holds us or sets a standard to be accountable to that righteousness. It is a, compa- it is a command formed from 613 different examples and illustrations summarized in 10 commandments, wrote on two tablets. One tablet, the first five verses, deals with our relationship with God. Love and respect your parents is the same thing. God just extends His authority to us as we become parents. But He's still the Father. Love and obey our parents. Okay. The second five... The other two, the uh, second tablet is all about our relationship with each other. And Jesus says, you can't remember ten, ten laws. You can't remember two tablets. I'm going to break it into one statement. Do unto others as you, as you would want them to do unto you. Pretty easy. So our Lord has summarized God's law and give us the golden rule. Romans chapter 11, or I'm sorry, chapter 7, verse 11. The Apostle Paul writes this about the law of God. He says that, What then shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means. Yet, if it had not been the law, for the law, I would have not known sin. For I would have not have known what it is to covet if the law said, you shall not covet. Another example, just 10 verses later, in verse 17, Paul says, For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it, killed me. God's law exposes our sin. God's law also has a second principle. First of all, the exposure of sin, the blood of Christ covers that. We can never keep God's law. Never. There is no one except our Lord who is ever able to keep perfectly keep God's law. And Jesus' blood covers that first principle. So we are no longer accountable for our sin. That doesn't mean we can continue to sin. And the Holy Spirit's not going to let us get away with that. But that first principle is covered by the blood of Christ. The second principle is also incredibly important with our relationship with Christ. 2 Timothy 3.16 says this, All Scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, and for correction, and for training in righteousness. See, God's Word and the Holy Spirit's wisdom and the Holy Spirit's revealing transforms us or continues to sanctify us through continued training and correction. This book is the handbook for your life. It's the owner's manual. You want to know how to live? As the rabbi says, go and learn it. This is it. You want to know how to live your life with hope and joy and contentment and peace and security eternally? This is the book for you. Remember long ago in our study when we first started out that Jesus told us that our righteousness would have to exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. He says, if you want to get into the kingdom of heaven, your righteousness will have to exceed that of the Pharisees and the scribes. They were the religious leaders. How is it possible that our righteousness can exceed theirs? The golden rule. This is how we do it. We live out 
Jesus' command to action in the golden rule. As I said, they weren't guilty of murder because they hadn't murdered anyone. However, Jesus revealed to them that the heart of the law says that hate is the same as murder. The same would be true for adultery. When we live out the golden rule, we exceed their righteousness that Jesus was talking about because they were all about the negative command. We just won't do anything where we would get ourselves in trouble and we'll be good. That's not the golden rule. Jesus' golden rule calls you to action. I'm going to steal Tim Bourgeois' challenge that he gave at the end of his sermon to his congregation and issue the same to you. First of all, you need to know these ten in order. That is not a big deal. You need to know these ten right here. They're very important. Incredibly important. Second, I would like for you to join me in purposefully verbalizing and praying out the golden rule each day this week. Allow God to share His wisdom with you. Allow the Holy Spirit to reveal it to you. Let's pray. Oh, gracious Lord, I thank you so much for this building where we can assemble, where it's warm and cozy. God, I'm thankful for all these saints that are here this morning. I pray, Lord, that you would just bless them and their homes, that you would prosper them and protect them from evil. God, I pray for all the kids that are in this room behind us or behind me. Father, they're all wonderful children, and we love them dearly. I pray, God, that you would help us as parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, whatever the relationship is. Father, that we, you would help us to realize that more than anything, we are charged to invest in their lives so that they might understand your righteousness and the salvation that is available through Christ. If we get everything else wrong, God, help us get that right. Help us impress the importance of salvation on their hearts. Help them understand the consequences of sin. As we hold them accountable, Father, to the authority that you've given us, help us be accountable to you. Help us to be honest with ourselves. That's the key, God. We have to admit there's a problem in our life and ask you to intervene hand it over to you and let you get it corrected. God, as we prepare for this time of communion, I just ask that you would help us to remember that price that was paid so long ago, Calvary. On that hill called Golgotha, Jesus carried a cross that they would place in a hole. It already scourged him. He was nearly dead already from all the loss of blood. And as he hung on that cross, taking care of our sins, allowing your wrath to pour out upon them, he prayed for us. He said, God, forgive them for they do not know what they do. God, my sin put Jesus on that cross. We are all very sorry. And we all ask for your forgiveness. Father, help us to take the cup and the loaf in a manner that's pleasing to you as we reflect on our hearts and our relationship with Jesus. It's in his name we pray these things. Amen. They're in the middle of it.